Well, thanks for coming. I know it's a small group, but I'm pleased to see you all. And if you have any more of these cards, anybody have one? No? Okay. Um, uh, so anyway, I'm glad to be here. I, um, so, so I wanted to, let me get, jump in with one of these cards right away, okay? Um, I'm not going to do this one, sorry. <laughs> what did say? I'm leaving that out until later. Um, this one I like. I'd like to hear about key pivot points, assuming there are any, in your career and decisions and you made why, and, and those that you made and why. Um, most of my career decision points have been largely due to my husband. Uh, he has dragged us around the world um, more times than I can than I can practically count, and usually I have absolutely no choice. I do remember one time we lived in New Orleans, and um, I get a call. I'm working at Amico, and I get a call at 10 o'clock in the morning, and he says, um, "You remember that job I applied for in Japan?" And I thought to myself, I think I would have remembered that. <laughs> no, I said, I really don't remember that. He says, no worries. All up to you. We have 24 hours to decide. <laughs> I said, then please talk quickly. <laughs> the minutes are waning. Um, but no, seriously. Uh, he, has, um, he has been uh, an, op an opportunity, uh, a minute, to, to try out new things and go to new places. And I highly recommend if you get the chance to do any of these sort of things, somebody taps you on the shoulder or your family gets a chance to go somewhere absolutely crazy that you've either never heard of or never wanted to go to, do it. Do it. It's been an incredible chance to not only see the world, learn about new cultures, I'm somebody who I almost flunked French class. I mean, literally, they dragged my mother in there, and um, and so I had a then I had a mentor student, you know, my my good friend who you know would teach me, and I thought, oh my God, I'm going to Japan where I will need to learn Japanese, or maybe I won't be able to speak at all, and then maybe I'll totally tick off the the top um, head mama, and I won't be able to um, be part of any of the the Navy things either. I, I was quite worried. I was quite worried. Although if I tell you the thing that really was the most amazing thing is the thing that upset me the most is that I would make friends really quickly there. It was such a tight community. They would do anything for you, absolutely anything. And it's when they all left that was the hardest thing. Each people, because they have this rolling, leaving thing that you just totally, totally don't expect. So so anyway, so let me tell you a little bit. I, I, um, I started my career at um, here. And then um, when I graduated, I was, I was kind of angry. I was angry because I had no idea that I was being prepared for a life in the Department of Defense, that all this math and, and training in computer engineering was so, at that time, so focused, especially the analysis stuff. People who were coming in to, to interview with us were, were all about DOD. And I thought, what? how come you all didn't tell us this? And then I thought, well, wait a minute, I guess I didn't ask. Yeah. <laughs> and I asking would have been good. But I, but I got over that. But when I first started at, the, at uh, the Applied Physics Lab, I remember learning about fire control solutions. And that was, I thought, oh, they're controlling fires here. And that's weapons. That's weapons. Yeah, so not, not exactly what you think. Um, so um, one second. So I was talking to somebody the other day, and they asked me, um, "Oh, you have you have these various degrees that, that Khalil was was mentioning. You have the engineering, you know, undergrad, and then and then while I, after while I was working for the Applied Physics Lab, I got my master's in math, and um, at, it was numerical science." Master's in numerical science while I was working at the Applied Physics Lab. And I did that because I thought, well, I've already got all this computer engineering, and I barely use that. I only use just the, the PL1 language, which you all have never heard of. Right? Um, I learned that and used that to write the simulations on, on weapon systems that now are used throughout the entire fleet of ships. It's amazing when you're on this little project uh, and you're just a, just a right out of college, and now this is on 170 ships in the United States Navy. And it's the major weapon system on that ship. I mean, that's kind of mind boggling for me. Um, but I thought, well, I don't even use the computer stuff they already taught me. Why would I get another master's in that? So when I was at the Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, they wanted you to get an advanced degree. So I looked and what are my choices? Well, I can't do physics. I don't know much about that. I'm not doing the computer one. 
I guess the only choice I have is this numerical science degree. So I took this numerical science degree. There I did everything by hand that you can now do with the press of a button. I mean, if we had to um, invert a matrix, by hand. If we were doing Newton's method, by hand. If you had to, whatever complicated mathematical thing that you do now with a very, very quick click, we were doing it for like four hours by hand. And it didn't really sink in that this was really anything wonderful that I loved, but I was doing it. I was doing it. <laughs> so it turns out, it, it turns out that um, I never once used that numerical science to read, not, not for one minute anywhere did I use the, anything I learned from that degree until now. Now, by the way, I graduated in 1980. Then I got my master's in business here. 1985, I'm skipping over the one from, from Hopkins for the math. So I thought, oh, 80, 85, I'm a numbers person. 90, I'll be back for my PhD for 90. I'm off by just a little tiny bit here. Um, instead of arithmetic, five, 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 it was five, 25. <laughs> powers I was working on there. But in fact, in fact, I was. So um, I actually am now, um, I've, my husband has moved us. I've had a lot of different jobs and Khalil, Khalil talked about those a little bit and they've been exciting, really, really wonderful opportunities to um, impact all different kinds of industries, all different kinds of um, questions and problems. But the funny thing is, I thought to myself, this isn't really me. You know, I get a chance to get this big job, but then all I want to do is analyze the data. All I want to do is find some little piece of this job where I can hunker down and figure out, oh, that's wrong. Oh, they should have calculated it this way. And then I tell my boss all happy with my, little, my new little, he's like, why are you doing that? <laughs> I'm like, well, I don't know. I, yeah, I'm right, though. I'm right. It's not correct. It's not correct. So, um, so I started to realize that my passion is math. My passion is an analyzing things. My passion is related to computers and all these other jobs. They want me to manage programs and you know. And people think when you go to apply for a job, they think, well, you don't really want to do this. Yeah, I do. You don't really want to analyze this low-level, deep-level thing that we would hire a, a newly minted MBA a bachelor. I said, yes, I do. That's what I really want to do. No, 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 no. We don't want that. You don't want that. I'm like, no, I do. I even went to a place, FTI, they are an, an analytical firm, and, and I met with some, some high-level guy, care of, care of a connection that I have, and he says, oh, we love your background, we love your background. I said, wonderful, I'd love to work for you guys. He says, well, um, are you doing this work now? I said, no, but I've analyzed stuff for my entire career. Every job I have is analysis related. I've, I've analyzed things for, for 25, he said 25 is really more than that, as you, you can do the subtraction. And he's like, well, do you have a book of business, like about a million dollars? I said, if I had a book of business, why would I be here talking to you? <laughs> I'm a one-man shop. I can add a few people here and there if I need to. Why? That's crazy. <laughs> he said, we poss could possibly do it. I said, I'll start at the bottom. Just like, you can pay me what you pay these guys. I'm fine. Oh, no, we can't do that. I'm like, really? So here's a lesson. So you asked me about the pivot points. And I would say that where they are, take them. Where you have choices, um, I'm the kind of person where um, I'm, I'm not a big planner. Um, you could tell because we got there late to Khalil's office, it was not Dawson's fault. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to plan when I have to, because that happens in life. But what I often find is I have a compass, and that compass, it gets me out of the woods where I often find myself. So that compass gets me back on track when I'm, when I'm astray. But, um, but what you need, though, is the willingness to jump in and do something that you never thought you could do, that you never even knew you knew how to do, because frankly, you didn't know how to do it. Um, but you, you're on the job, and they will train you, or they won't train you, but you still have that role that you have to do. You still have those questions that you discover. And here's another intriguing thing that you'll notice, and people who are older around the room know this, but maybe the younger people don't know this, you're gonna take a job. You're gonna get there into this job, and you'll be the youngest, newest person, and you'll be like not comfortable, a little bit un unsure, and not sure you know how to do, but you're learning. Whatever they teach you, you're learning and you're doing it. And all of a sudden, one day, you're gonna come up and you're gonna say to somebody, 
I'm totally screwed up. I don't know how to do this. I, I, I thought I knew how to do this, but, but I'm, I'm totally confused. You're not confused. That thing you're looking at is wrong. You have found an error, one of the many errors you will find in all the things that you do. And you are right, and these other people are wrong. And you can't believe that you, the newly minted person, has actually figured out something that they've been using for 25 years that is inverted. It might be one over the value it should be. Or I know I worked for an investment firm, and I was their chief compliance officer. And while I was there, I discovered that their formula for one of their major products for the performance was wrong. I mean, that's kind of major, so I'm not telling you any more details. <laughs> <laughs> or or um, when, I, when I worked for, um, for um, Freddie Mac, and I looked through, and they had some stock. Um, they would do stock offerings pretty regularly. I mean, they're a huge, enormous, enormous company. And there were rules about that, about when they're allowed and when they're not allowed to do these things. You, there's all kinds of rules about you can't be, you can't be stoking the, the market, basically. You can't just pick when, the, when your stock is high and sell, sell the stock then. Well, I did a little analysis. And guess what they were doing? <laughs> they were doing it when it was high. <laughs> because I actually went through like back for like 10 years of data because I love data. <laughs> and sure enough, um, I actually found several other things they were doing. Um, for example, they had, a, they had me do an analysis of the um, debt desk. And my job was to look at all these federal re regulations and to see if they were following all these regulations because that was what they had to do in the investment world. And well, that was all good, and I, and I, and I did that. And I thought, well, I, I'm one of these people. Here's another tip. When you get a chance to do the field trip, do the field trip. Go tell them, I need to see it in person. I need to see it in person. So I said, I, I need to sit there for, for a day or two on the dead desk with those people. I need to see how this works. OK, they said, seems reasonable. So I go over, and I'm hanging out with the guys. And I knew these people from the work. And I'm sitting there, and would you believe in the very two days the very two days that I was there, okay, out of all the days in the year, all the years there are, there was a trade that never got booked. We found a trade that hadn't been booked for a month. That's illegal. <laughs> the Federal Reserve requires trades to be, to be squared off at, at 2.30 every day. <laughs> when you're big like they are and they, and they have, they have an, a, enough, enough um, bonds that are bigger than most, most economies of the world, you have to... You have to square those trades away. And they said, oh, this is, this is like a never can possibly happen. All these factors had to come together in order to make this happen. And I'm thinking to myself, no friggin' way. For these, all these five factors to happen all at once on the very day that I, the little investigator, is sitting there? Are you for real? This happens all the time. But nobody sees it. Nobody looks at it. Nobody finds it. Nobody knows that it's happening. Because everybody assumes it looks so pretty, it must be pretty, it must be right. And that's another tip I want to tell you. These days, unlike when I was in school and Khalil was in school, we had to do like every little thing by hand. Don't forget the computers. There were no PCs. The fact is we were using punch cards. I'm not kidding. We, while we were there, the field improved to the point where we could use those line printers. We were ecstatic with those. <laughs> we hadn't gotten to screens yet. So what happens now, and I've seen this several times, a lot of times, you go and somebody makes a presentation at your company. You'll be there. Um, and they're telling how all this stuff works, blah, blah, blah. And it looks gorgeous. That's the key. It looks gorgeous. They've got the PowerPoints. It's all, you know, all these, they've got the math. They've got the, the analysis. They've got the graphs. They've got the everything else. There's only one little problem. They don't understand any of it. They're easily able to push a lot of buttons now because all these tools exist. And anybody who has a license to get on that computer can make it all work. But it doesn't have to be right. Keep checking. Keep checking. You're going to find over and over these things are not right because there are more mistakes that are harder to find. When we did them by hand and we scratched out and erased something, we scratched out and erased something, our boss noticed that. They're like, what's this thing? You know, it's like, it's like a beacon asking to look at it. Well, the fact is now it's hard to find because it all looks so perfect. But it's not perfect. It's not correct. I had this happen the other day. So I was telling you I never used that, um, jumping around a little, sorry, that's what it is, my style. Um, I've never used that master's until 
now, that master's in numerical, numerical science that I never used one single day in my life, I now am using. Why? Because I am taking a master's in data analytics. And I'm doing it, I'm doing it because here's the thing, I love data and nobody really wants me to do it but me. But I think maybe if I get this spanking new degree and I'm newly minted like you guys, and I come off and I apply and whatever, and they say, oh, I, I, might, I might even just leave off all the other degrees. I think it might work out better. Right, they don't want to know that I have a finance degree. They don't want to know that I got a degree in 1980 and I, and I, and I didn't know what a, this kind of an IP or anything was. No, all they care about is that I can do the data analysis and they're gonna see this spanking new thing and now suddenly I'm doing statistics again. So this, this woman who's in my team she says to me, oh, don't worry, don't worry. I understand why you don't know this because I took four classes in statistics and I understand it. And she does, oh, she's a godsend. And I said, you don't understand. I took an entire degree in this, but it was almost 40 years ago. <laughs> I don't remember anything. <laughs> so I'm, I, I truly feel that the, the old days, one of the things that always confused me was when you had to do these sample sizes. Yeah, any of you take statistics and you have to do the sample sizes and then you say to yourself, well, wait a minute now, when I want to take the, this, the variance and I want to take the standard deviation, is it over the square root of n? Or is it over the square root of n minus one? Or is it over the square root of n minus two? I, that always confused me. I never could tell which thing I was supposed to do it. And if it's in the test and you'd get that wrong, that's it, it's wrong. What I like now about today is there's so much data. There's so much data out there that we're getting to a point, you don't do samples anymore. We look at it all. And I think, great, great. Because now it's not so much, is there, they used to say correlation doesn't prove causation, right? That was the mantra. Correlation does not prove causation. Meaning it may look like it's, like it's together, but that doesn't mean it really is. Today, if you have like a terabyte of data and it looks like it is, it is. There's not a question, it is. Now the question is maybe why, why is it? But if you find that it's correlated and you have this enormous cache of data, I think it's time to start saying, we're gonna find the cause. And it, there, there's gonna be some smoking gun in there because I believe data determines. We're in a world of economic data determination. And that is something that I have always believed. You, the data tells the story. And that's what I always want to do for companies. And I have this little, tiny little business, does a little here, does a little there. But I have finally convinced, and I can't tell you the name of the company, but I have finally convinced a fairly sizable company to let me help them analyze their data. And I can't tell you how excited I am. I practically leap out of my bed every morning. I am like, oh my God, excited. The reason I can't tell you is because I'm still in the pilot. And they have to say, yeah, yeah, we really like you and we want you to continue. And by the way, all the stuff I'm learning in my statistics and my, in my data analytics, oh, I'm going to be using that big time. Because we didn't have all these tools. If we did, maybe it was in the PhD program. I hadn't learned them in the master's that I took. So I'm very excited about that. Um, and I want to tell you a poem that I always liked. Um, it's by Langston Hughes. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat? Or crust over, or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? I saw this, um, this was in a, in a play I saw about 30 years ago. And to me, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing right now. That's why I'm taking this master's in data analytics because this isn't the dress rehearsal. I'm the real me and I don't wanna just do some big job that somebody says, oh, you can do it. Well, meanwhile, I'm faking it completely because I don't, I'm not a program manager and most of these jobs, you're really a program manager. And that's a, that's a different person than me. That's, I mean, Stacy knows. If she doesn't like grab me by the arm or, or Crystal grab me by the arm and take me, I, I'm, uh, that isn't me, but analyze it. Go through every little piece of what, what could this mean and what could that mean and what could the other thing and research it to death. That is me. That is definitely me. And I love being in the weeds. 
yeah, maybe some point I'll go and I'll, and I'll lead some team. But, but frankly, I don't think so. You know the movie, um, uh, The Big Short? Did you see that movie? I was there at Freddie Mac at that time. And I was one of those people in the back that they didn't want to listen to who said, I don't think I get this. You have all these bonds you're putting together in a group and they're all like sea level. And now somehow we've sent them to the to, to, to S and P for a rating and now it's A level. I said, what gives? These are not A level. These are the same horrible C level ones that we started with. They said, oh no, no, they did it, that's fine. I said, no, it's not fine. Then I go to another thing, middle of the subcrime crisis, crisis right? I said, how about if we take a look at these bonds and the underlying data behind these? So I insisted. I, I was kind of a bit of a pain in the butt. Eventually, <laughs> I'll tell you the end of that part. So I, but I was in compliance. That was my job. Wasn't it my job to check these things? Keep us off the front pages of the Wall Street Journal? Well, I don't think I wasn't successful. I was trying. They got rid of my position. <laughs> I'm not kidding. You're not working there anymore. No, they, they literally said, well, thank you very much. <laughs> so I found, I said to them, I said, these, we need to analyze all of these bonds, all of these backgrounds of these bonds and find out um, if we have the data behind these because it was when the subprime was starting to become an issue. So we had this big meeting after we got all the data and I said, well, gee, this one doesn't have any data, and this one doesn't have any data, and this one doesn't have any data, and this one, and we had reams of this stuff that I'm, I'm toiling through, you know. They said, that doesn't matter. I said, that doesn't matter? No, because we have this other little program that shows that if you don't have the data, it's okay. I'm like, but we don't have the data. They would white wash that so fast, I don't know how they got it all through, but every time they didn't have what they wanted to have, they had somebody who was pushing it along and out the other side, done. And sure enough, I lost that battle too. They didn't literally have the backup data and it didn't matter to them because they were into the profit part of it. And the banks are often the bad guys. I wanna tell you, watch where the money takes you. The money is always the key. If you find, take for example that, the, the subprime crisis, it was the banks who, their role in this whole thing was to say, huh, we can make a lot of profit here. And the way we can make all this profit is we can go and provide loans, because when we provide a loan, we get a fee. Provide some more loans, we get a fee. Provide some more loans, we get a fee. All these fees are great for us. Oh, we shouldn't be doing that? We shouldn't be doing these loans? Maybe they aren't qualified? Maybe they won't be able to pay back? No problem, because we're going to be selling them to somebody else, and it'll be somebody else's problem. Thank you, Mr. Bank and Mrs. Bank. Well, they over and over are doing this. They did it in the bank, in the, um, the shipping industry, too. Go look in the about 2012 or 13. Um, there was a crescendo of oil and gas efforts and shipping efforts and the, the shipbuilders couldn't make the ships fast enough and the ship buyers couldn't buy the ships fast enough and the oil and gas companies couldn't use the ships fast enough. So they lowered their standards a little bit in the banks. How did they do that? Well, they allowed them to estimate their future, their future uh, oil and gas and their future <coughs> efforts on the ships and their future this, and they could use that as collateral to get the loans for the next ship. Seriously? And the next and the next? And then the bottom fell out of the oil and gas market. And then, big surprise, the bottom fell out, fell out of the shipping and the shipbuilding. And the banks, again, were at fault. Watch what the banks are pushing, because I'm telling you they're only doing it for, for them. I am telling you they are not the good actors. They are the bad actors. And they are always the ones who are helping us to find our weakest point Boom, down we go into abyss. And then they just, off to the next thing. I'm ready with my shiny loafers. <laughs> so let's see, um, pivot points, key points, let's see. My background in finance, oh wow. So the, so the question is, I hope, I hope to learn what, how you used your STEM background <clears throat> to work in finance and the business field. Um, I've worked in finance for my, almost my entire career. 
So I started at APL, as I told you, doing, doing weapons analysis, which, which was very cool. But by the way, I told you about those um, sideline to the question. I told you about take, take the field trip. So while I was at APL, I dated this guy who was a reservist in the Navy. He had been in the Navy full time. And he said, you don't know our customer. I said, what do you mean I don't know our customer? He says, you don't know our customer. Our customer is the Navy. I said, OK. He says, you need to get on the ship. I said, I do? Yes. I said, well, how would I do that? He said, start talking to all these managers you're friends with. You know, I'm a little guy. But I was always very friendly. So I said, OK. So every day for lunch, instead of going to the friends I had, I would go to sit down with one of the managers. And they were very nice about it. It wasn't like a separate dining room or anything. Everything was very low level. They're sitting there like, hey, Jim, can I join you? Sure, sit down. I'm sitting down. And I'd say, hey, Jim, I'd really love to get on the ship. Can I get on the ship? I don't know. Next day, somebody else. Hey, Tom, I would really love to get on the ship. I'm not kidding. When I have a mission, <laughs> I am there. I am there. And eventually, one day, Jim comes back to me and he says, you got your wish? I said, what wish? Because I'd forgotten. I mean, this is months. Because you're getting on the ship. And that was totally cool. I went through the Panama Canal twice. I was on the ship six weeks total out of like three or four trips. I had more ship time than my husband, who was a naval architect working for the Navy. For 25 years, I had more ship time than he did. Ha ha. I, don't, I did learn that over him for sure. There's absolute for sure. So I want to tell you about me and, and data and me and looking looking for not just a little, but going, going all and all for me. So when I was uh, right out of school, I went to the Applied Physics Lab, as I told you, and they had an associate staff training program. That's another thing. If you get a chance to do one of those where you go through different departments and you think, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. I'm not interested in that or that. Do it. You don't even know yet what you're interested in. You'll be amazed that the thing over there that you were sure you didn't like is the thing you like way better than the thing you thought you were going to sign up for. So I went to the print training program, and Khalil was right. There were very few of us women. 26 people were in that special training program that amongst the many people they hired. The lab had about 2,600 people. So it was a big lab as part of Hopkins. And the lab did um, medical space, but mostly Navy work. OK. So here's those 26 of us in this training program in the chimney, the chimney top suite of, of the lab. Two of us women, both named Karen, and 24 guys. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So we had a very good time. We, they taught us little classes, more statistics, which I later forgot. Taught us some statistics, radar, everything you needed to know. They gave us a little, which I love that. And they're going to teach me. I, I want to gobble it up. Then we had a, pro, a project we had to do together. Our project was on shipping lanes. And it was very interesting, although not half as interesting as the next year's class who worked on the space shuttle heat shield. I would have liked to do that. But that's OK. So one of the things we were supposed to do at the end of this training program, we had three, four months was to decide where were we going to go for our permanent job. This was just a little portion in, in, on the way. So they said, well, you can interview with some of the people that have given talks you know, to you all to introduce the areas. You can interview with them or, or their subgroups. You know, they're, they're happy. You just, you just contact their secretary, and, and they will you know, they'll help you set it up. OK, very good. And they said, and at the end, what you're going to do is give us your top three picks, and then we'll do our best to give you know, everybody what they want. Okay, so, so we had some time on our hands. We would do the studying on the classes they were giving us. We would do our work on the project. And then we goofed around a lot, you know, the, the airplanes, the paper airplanes. So I would make my appointments to see and meet, you know, the people we had met and then the people in their departments and some of the, some of the other sections and whatnot. So it came time to put in, you know, for our requested three. It was hard for me to choose. You know, I had, I had gone to, you know, I really wanted to know. Um, about the different places. And I, and I liked the one that I had started in, but I still wanted to look around. So I had the meeting with them about my three. They said, I just want to tell you, um, we've never experienced this before. I said, what's that? They said, well, you put in and interviewed 103 sections. I said, yeah. They said, everyone else did seven. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, well, I thought we were supposed to look at everything. <laughs> I was like, OK, fair enough. But I think that is a sort of a trend for me that N is usually all. So I'm in the right place now with this new data degree and the way that big data is going. Because I had another experience like that when I was here. As a, I had already gotten my undergrad. I'd already done that. And I decided to go back for the business degree. Because in those days, they said the ticket 
didn't say ticket to what? Ticket was the engineering degree with the business degree. That was the ticket, for the MBA. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm game. Okay, so I come here. My, my friend Dennis said um, I'd be changing my life. I said, no, Dennis, I'm just going to come back and you're going to work for me instead of me working for you. <laughs> he was right. I was wrong. I changed my life. So, so I'm here, and it turns out it was during the time of one of the big elections. I don't want to get into politics, so I won't tell you which side I was on. I mean, I'm happy to tell you, but you might not like it. You know. so, so my parents sent me while I was here, they sent me this brochure and a letter, like a form letter. I got a form letter from my own parents. <laughs> I'm not kidding. So the form letter is all about their concerns about this one guy. And, um, and, um, and then there's a brochure from some organization that, that supports it and has all these problematic things. Don't do this. And we'll look at what the problems would be if this. And it's a very nicely done thing. I mean, just one or two pages it's very nice and the letter's good I'm like wow oh my god I'm so glad they sent me this I mean it was weird getting the form letter so I thought I'm gonna do this so I look in the back and I see oh I see that there's a this is where I can buy the you know I can get more of these brochures so I contact the place and I said you know I'd like to get some of those brochures I, I, I want to hand them out and they said well how many do you want I said well I don't know um, and I'm thinking I'm in business school here I'll stand and hand them out I'm, I don't know uh, how many are in a box? And they said, well, you know, 500. I said, I'll take two boxes. OK. They send me the two boxes. Handing them out, handing them out. I'm standing at like one of the major hallways. You can't get by me without me handing it to you. you know? <laughs> so it's all good. And I'm telling them you know, what my issue is as, they, as they're going by. And people are being nice. They're taking it. So I go back and call my parents you know, nightly. In those days, you had to call like Saturday night at 11. 11, the rates went down. Before that, it was too expensive to call. So I called my parents like the, the next weekend after. It took me a couple weeks or a couple days or a week and a half, whatever it was. It took me a while to hand out these things, but I handed them all out. And I said, oh, I love that thing you sent me. That was so great. You know, I'm so glad you did. I, I ordered some. I sent them out. I said, that was just fantastic. I said, oh, by the way, um, how many people did you send that letter to? They said 50. <laughs> I said, oh, I, I handed out 1,000. <laughs> So I'm, I don't know when I do it. I, I, um, I try to do it. I, I don't even think there can be a small. There's a, there's a you're doing it or you're not doing it. And if you're doing it, you're really doing it. Um, so um, in terms of finance, you asked me. So I accidentally completely fell into um, the financial world. As my friend Dennis said, you're going to change your life. And I thought, no, I'm not changing my life. I told them at work, this is a complete lie. I told them that I was going to go to get training on project management and program management. I really wanted it at that time. I did, because I wanted to go from where I, my little world to the, the program office. That seemed like a more exciting place. And I thought you could either wait the 20 years at APL, because there's only three levels and very few different roles. So I wanted to go there. And I thought, I'll never get there. It'd take me forever. I'll get this MBA degree. They'll teach me how to manage a program and a project, and boom. I'll go into the program office. Great. So I wrote that down in my request for leave of absence from APL. Um, this is what I want to do, and I'm going to get training on program management. The only thing was, I had looked through the brochure. This is one of the few times I'd actually read the, the uh, bulletins in those days. They had the books the, uh, about this in school. There wasn't a single class on project management, not one. <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to actually study, but I knew that I was not going to study that. And um, and I didn't. I didn't. Um, but while I was here, that was the go-go 80s. And in the go-go 80s, everything was like more and better and bigger and more um, uh, new companies going public every day and the stock prices going up. And you know everybody was all excited, rah, rah. And investment banking was the thing. Not management consulting, which I think is the big thing right now. Oh, no. That, was, that wasn't... Nothing, it was something, but investment banking, oh my God, this was, this was the nirvana that you all wanted to be doing, okay? My dad knew somebody at Alex Brown. I'm from Baltimore, Baltimore girl. Alex Brown's a Baltimore company, so I could be, you know, sort of home and didn't even bother applying to all the New York firms. Applied to Alex Brown because I had the in. I got in. And oh my God, oh my God. Be careful if you think you want these management consulting things and these investment banking. First of all, it's it's pretty much you're gonna you're gonna get an incredible amount of training. So that's the good side, an incredible amount of training because you pretty much work a double day every day. I mean, you're working. I think I worked 
on a good week, 70 hours. And I'm not exaggerating. We lived 15 minutes away in Baltimore City in a little, a little townhouse in the, in the city. And Howard spent two hours commuting each way to get to the Navy Department. And he would get home, and I wasn't home yet. And I was 15 minutes away. And then sometimes I had to go back at midnight. And then one time they had me go to New York for a, a public offering we were doing. And then I was there, and at 9 o'clock I called my boss, and I said, well, I think we're done for tonight. She says, come back. I said, come back? Aren't we doing the offering up here soon? She says, come back. We need you. 9 o'clock p.m., I take the train back to Baltimore three hours. She says, we need you in the, in, the, in the office in the morning. I said, oh, I got it, I got it. 8 o'clock in the morning, I get in the office after getting home at midnight, and I do a little bit of work. She says, we need to go to New York. <laughs> <laughs> and we went to New York that day. Now, can you imagine? No big deal for them. No big deal. When you needed to send a package to, to some, somebody, the accountants or whatever, they never heard of stamps. It was all couriers. Call a courier, call a courier. <laughs> it's, a, it's a heady life. It's an interesting life. But they will churn you up and spit you out if they can. And some people will do it and manage it. But I'm telling you, it is very tough. And most people were getting divorced. I looked around and I was like, oh my god, I was fairly newly married. I was like, wow. They, it, was not, it, was not a, it was not a role for a family person, I would say, at all. But uh, that was the beginning of my finance career. And I'm telling you, I learned a ton. I learned a ton, and that I cannot, cannot complain about in any way. But I wasn't made for that. I was, I was uh, I don't know, I was in tears most nights, and I was not able to do it. So I left that one, tried it again somewhere else. That didn't work either. And then finally just went on my way in the, in the finance world. And in the finance world, I was able to um, just do my analysis, do my data, do, which I loved. And they loved me. So I was able, everything you do in finance is something you really did in analyzing every math problem you've ever done. It is all the same thing. They just have a few more ratios they tell you how to do, or this rule or that rule. It's, it's all analysis. It's all the stuff you're doing in every engineering class that you do. And frankly, it's very cool that you have now a window into the impact, the impact on the market, the impact on other companies, the impact. I ended up doing strategic planning. I didn't know anything about strategic planning. They tapped me on the shoulder one day, and they said, hmm. The reason they tapped me on the shoulder was because we, we were, our company was doing this big nosedive. And uh, I had friends who were in the claims department and whatnot at this insurance company. And I would say, we'd have lunch. And they'd tell me all these concerns. So I was writing my 